Could members who are leaving the chamber please do so quietly? The final item of business today is the members' business debate on motion number 13739 in the name of Linda Fabiani on 100 years of women in policing. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could please press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible. I call on Linda Fabiani to open the debate. Seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and thank you everyone who signed this motion. Uh, I see we have Graeme Pearson, a former um, police officer, with us this evening, and I'm sure that although he's not very old, he will be familiar with the struggle that uh, women have had to ensure uh, parity in the police force over the years. Uh, as the motion states, this year marks a century since Edith Smith was appointed as the first female officer in the UK with full powers of arrest. This milestone is being celebrated by Police Scotland and the Lanarkshire Division held a successful event in East Kilbride in June to mark that occasion. It was fascinating and I was enthralled by the memorabilia on display uh, courtesy of George Barnsley of the Lanarkshire Police Historical Society. And of course I was fascinated by the stories behind that memorabilia. And I want to thank two thoroughly modern officers, Chief Inspector Gillian Scott and Inspector Louise Skelton, who were instrumental in the success of that event. So thank you very much to both of them. Uh, the history of women policing in Scotland and indeed in the UK as a whole is absolutely fascinating. It was in 1883 that the Metropolitan Police um, employed a female visitor to visit women convicts on a license and under police supervision. And the Women's Police Service itself was founded in 1914 by Nina Boyle, who was a, a suffragette journalist, and Margaret Damer Dawson, who was an anti-slavery campaigner, an anti-white slavery campaigner. And it was staffed uh, by volunteers. It was really interesting the way it came about because all of these uh, things were controversial. Edith Smith's appointment was controversial. The Home Office advised that women could not be sworn in because they didn't count as proper persons in the eyes of the law. Uh, in Grantham, however, the Chief Constable and the Watch Committee continued to give Miss Smith their full support because they thought her work was vital given the very particular problems that the town faced as a result of war conditions. But it was after the conclusion of war where it was felt that women could start to take more of a part in the police force. However, public opinion and the opinion of the establishment mitigated against that even at that time. And there was still huge resistance despite what women had showed during, necessarily during World War I in having to take over many of the roles that men had previously carried out. So even then, it was stated that the duties performed by women should be restricted to those involving females and child victims or complainants. And it was up to local police authorities to decide whether women were needed in that area. The Women in Scotland policing timeline is interesting. Um, it was 1915 to 18. Uh, that uh, Emily Miller joined the City of Glasgow Police and Jean Thomas joined Dundee City Police. It was in 1918 that Chief Constables generally um, were asked to consider appointing women where necessary. And in fact, in 1922, the Chief Constable of Dundee City was forced to publicly deny he had a woman working as a constable even though he did have one. I was fascinated by that. I don't know what they did with her. <laughs> you know, I managed to hide the fact that she was there and I couldn't find any further information. So there, there's a job for our former police officer sitting over there. But times moved on and it was in 1924 that women constables were granted the power of arrest in Scotland. And uh, Jean Malloy was promoted to detective sergeant in 1940, becoming the first woman in Scotland to gain rank. We then had a chief inspector in 90, 1954, and at the same time, we had the first uniformed sergeants. It wasn't until 1962 uh, that police women attached to the CID were recognised as detective constables. 
And in fact, it was only in 1968 that policewomen were allowed to remain in post uh, after marriage. So, <laughs> Fiona, it's all right. <laughs> and my colleague Fiona McLeod's having a problem with that here. But that, that timeline brings me back to the event in East Kilbride where Christina McKelvey and me were privileged to meet and talk with two smashing ladies. Uh, Dorothy Parker, who's still resident in EK, and uh, Barbara McAnally, who's resident in Bishop Briggs, but who served as a sergeant in East Kilbride. I spoke to Dorothy last night just to make sure that I had, you know, the story right that she'd spoken to Christine and I about that day. And she told me that in 1972, despite it um, being in the late 60s, as I said, that policewomen were allowed to stay in post after marriage, she had to ask the chief constable for permission to stay. I can see Mr Pearson's nodding away, so he's actually older than we all thought. So, <laughs> Dorothy recalled that women officers had different duties from the men. There was only one woman in every shift who was to deal with women and children. And even after passing the full driving course, Dorothy was only allowed to drive if a qualified male was in the car. She also told me that they weren't allowed to wear trousers. And I won't go into the stories of what she used to do when she had to chase felons uh, down the street. And then I got on to Barbara McAnally. She was fascinating as well. She actually was really hitting against that glass ceiling of the time because Barbara was promoted to East, an East Kilbride as sergeant in the mid-1960s. And then she went to the CID in Shettleson. She had started out as a typist in the police force in Rutherglen in the 50s and then moved into the force itself. And she told me that she still has her payslips, her last payslip, from being a typist at uh, the police in Rutherglen, where she got three pounds a week. And in fact, she used to put two shillings a week in the holiday fund to pay for her holidays every year. When she moved into being a police officer, she was in seven pounds a week. And that included a plain clothes allowance because all the women police officers' uniforms had to be made to measure because there wasn't enough of them to warrant uh, off the peg. So from that point, things really moved on. Uh, it was in 1976 that policewomen came to be known as Constable Sergeant, etc., rather than WPC, W Sergeant. So that created a, a, a form of equality with male colleagues. 1995, Sandra Hood became the first woman in Scotland to hold the rank of Chief Superintendent. 2006, Margaret Barr was appointed Director of the Scottish Police College at Tully Allen. 2008, Norma Graham became Scotland's first female Chief Constable at Fife. And of course, in 2012, Rose Fitzpatrick was appointed as first female Deputy Chief Constable of Police Scotland. So now, across the UK, there are more than 40,000 female officers. And almost 40% of Police Scotland recruits this year are women, which is the highest proportion ever. But I believe that we have to look back to people uh, like Dorothy Parker and Barbara McAnally and all their contemporaries who fought against the system at the time and followed a vocation. And we have to also recognise the diverse policing roles that women now hold and the positive role that women officers have played and continue to play in keeping everyone safe in their communities. Thank you. Many thanks. I now turn to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes, please. Annabel Goldie to be followed by Graham Pearson. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm delighted to participate in this evening's debate, marking 100 years of women in policing, and I thank Linda Fabiani for bringing this debate to the Chamber. Over the past 24 hours, the headlines have been dominated by the tragic death in the front line of PC David Phillips in Liverpool. And as the Prime Minister said, it serves as a stark reminder that there's no such thing as a safe day if you're a police officer. So I'd like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to the men and women who put themselves in danger day in and day out to keep our communities safe because we are truly indebted to them and I thank them for all they do. As we celebrate 100 years of women in policing, I'm struck that Edith Smith, the first ever woman to become a police constable, was sworn in during the first 
World War. I also noted she was sworn in at Grantham in Lincolnshire, a town not unfamiliar with the achievement of females and, of course, a town which was to produce Britain's first female Prime Minister. But 1915 reflected dark and desperately unsafe times, and it was testament to Edith Smith's immense strength and bravery that she led the way as the first woman to have policing powers commensurate with those of her male counterparts. And that is all the more remarkable, as women did not count, as Linda Fabiani pointed out, proper citizens in the eyes of the law in the early 20th century. And without doubt, pioneering people like Edith Smith have helped to change the discourse surrounding women aspiring to the workplace over the past 100 years. But in celebrating her achievements, we should reflect that opening a path for women in the police force was not necessarily synonymous with championing the rights of women. Uh, personally, I'm sure she was committed to doing that, but the very nature of her specialist duties, to which I think Linda Fabiani was obliquely referring, meant that she was often engaged uh, in the moral regulation of her female peers, such as conducting surveillance on behalf of service men with doubts about spousal fidelity. Her appointment was not a fait accompli for female equality, far from it, in fact, and it is worth remembering that women were not admitted to policing on the same pay, terms and conditions as men until the Sex Dim Discrimination and Equal Pay Acts of the 1970s. But it is positive to learn that today almost 40% of recruits at the Scottish Police College are women, and I hope that more women will pursue policing as a career in the future. But I don't think Police Scotland should rest on its laurels, because the Scottish Police Authority data shows that in December 2014, women are underrepresented in senior posts across the single force, and that is not in any way to diminish the achievements to which Linda Fabiani referred. But if you consider that 17% are superintendents, 10% detective superintendents, 24% chief superintendents, and 13% detective chief superintendents, then I think we cannot feel complacent about these figures. Now, I'm not uh, advocating that women should be promoted in anything other than merit, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, but I do think the figures beg some questions. But at least, to some extent, women are now involved in every aspect of Scottish policing, and we must ensure that the environment encourages able female officers to stay so that they can move up the ranks. The survey last week indicated a perhaps disquieting element of uh, officers who want to leave the force in the next three years. And I think more women recruits will go some way towards redressing the existing gender imbalance in the future, but the long-term impact will be lost if staff leave. So I think there is a huge obligation on the SPA chairman, Andrew Flanagan, and the new chief constable to be sensitive to the needs of staff and to create a working environment that fosters long-term careers for all officers, regardless of gender. Women in the police, police force, as Linda Fabiani has indicated and her motion confirms, have a very distinguished record in Scotland of service. And I think we need to look at the situation across the board because I think we can do it better and I think we owe it to Edith Smith to try and achieve that. Many thanks. I now call Graham Pearson to be followed by Alison McInnes. Thank you, President Officer, and thank you to Linda Fabiani for giving me the opportunity to support her in the motion this evening. Uh, I begin by acknowledging the murder of Dave Phillips in Merseyside, leaving behind two beautiful daughters, a wife, family and friends. He made the ultimate sacrifice offered by a police officer who was merely performing his duty. That death comes barely three years since in September 2012, Fiona Bowen and Nicola Hughes, both police officers, were mercilessly gunned down as they too performed duties on behalf of the public. For every family and their friends who have suffered personally the impact of a police officer's death in duty circumstances, the distress of this week's news will merely kick off again their own individual tragedies. In that light, it is particularly poignant that we should celebrate 100 years of women in the police service across Britain. Much has been delivered by women officers in that time, but much more as, as yet needs attention to ensure policing in Scotland, as elsewhere in the UK, is capable of enabling, empowering women 
to play their full part. In 1970, I arrived at Maitland Street Police Office in Glasgow to begin policing in the north and east end of the city. My shift comprised entirely of men, mostly veterans of the war, many of Highland extraction, all huge in build, and focus on street duties rather than administrative duties. A few women operated in the police station as officers. Uh, a couple were attached to the CID, and occasionally I caught sight of a policewoman from headquarters where I was told an entire policewoman's department existed, but I think it was merely a handful of women who were based there. In that time, it was led by a formidable woman whose reputation went before her and no one tangled with. That department dealt primarily with missing persons, sex crimes involving children, and a host of caring needs responded to by police. In 1974, women detective constables and the very unusual women sergeants were becoming more visible in the service. And at this point, I was transferred to the drug squad to be told I would neighbour a shorthand in the service for work alongside a WDC, a woman detective constable. Her name was Brenda Flynn. Being a man in a male-dominated culture working on the streets, I duly felt horrified at the prospect. However, in the coming days, weeks and months, I learned how fortunate I was to have a woman as a colleague and lucky to have one as professional as Brenda. The experience proved an early lesson to me. It's not the gender of a person that matters. It's the value, commitment and professionalism that provides their worth to the public. In the intervening three decades, I've met significant numbers of very impressive women operating no longer as women, but now part of the mainstream as police officers. The service now relies on women to deliver. Two years ago, women represented 37% of the Scottish Police Service. It could not operate without women in its ranks. This is a very brief debate, but I couldn't finish uh, without saying that women still have much to do to maximise the benefits that women bring, and men in the service have much to do to enable that to occur. At promoted ranks, as has previously been said, Women fall dramatically in terms of representation from 20% down to 9% as they move up through the ranks. As with the armed service, the police have a checkered history in managing the issues that arise from men and women working together in what had previously been seen as a man's world. Fiona Bowen and Nicola Hughes, along with others, should put an end to the notion of a man's world. Policing is complex and a challenging environment and needs all the skills that both men and, women, men and women bring to it. I commend Linda Fabiani for raising the issue and hope that women around the country will take a pride in those who represent them in the police service. Thanks. Many thanks. I now call Alison McInnes to be followed by David Torrance. Thanks very much, and I too would like to thank Linda Fabiani for securing this debate marking 100 years of women in policing. At the time when the first female officer with full arrest powers was appointed in England, across the UK around 4,000 women were already taking on policing functions as voluntary patrols. But the appointment of Edith Smith, however, started a new chapter, at a time when a lot of opportunities were opening up to women due to the human cost of the First World War. I'm pleased to note that one of the first women officers in Scotland, Jean Thompson, Thomas, was from my region and joined Dundee City Police shortly after Edith Smith was appointed. I'm less pleased to note that years later, as Linda Fabiani pointed out, the Chief Constable of Dundee was forced, forced to publicly deny that he had a woman working as a constable. So times have certainly changed. As we know, at the very beginning, women officers were paid less, were required to leave the force after they'd married and had separate service titles to men. But they were there and they were beginning to make a difference. Many things have changed in a relatively short period of time since then. Today in Scotland, we have a female Deputy Chief Constable, Rose Fitzpatrick. And as others have said, this year's intake at the Scottish Police College in Tully Allen had nearly 40% of women. 
Uh, just last month in September, Laura Collins was named Special Constable of the Year after putting in a phenomenal 1,200 hours of volunteering. Women are now able to do any job within the police service and are seen as equals to their male counterparts concerning their terms and conditions of employment. And yet, of course, challenges remain. In figures published by the SPA in 2014, only 31% of recruits were women. In a Scottish police staff survey, which was published just last week, 63% of female respondents said they felt like they were being treated fairly at work. And of course, that means that over a third of women who responded do not feel that they are being treated fairly at work. And that is something we should be concerned about. While I recognise that women hold such diverse roles as firearms officers, counter-terrorism officers and investigators, there is still a way to go. The Scottish Women's Development Forum, an organisation which aims to tackle the gender gap within Police Scotland, uh, within Police Scotland ranks, estimated that in 2014 only 29% of all police officers were women, only 20% of promoted posts were taken up and only 36% of special constables were women. So those numbers clearly show that we need to do much more to encourage and foster women to firstly take up posts within the police and secondly to help them rise through the ranks. And that means tackling the biases currently in the system. So workplace policies and practices need to be reviewed to ensure that the police service is a fair place to work for everyone. And as in other sectors, the need for flexible working is particularly important for women officers with caring responsibilities. It's worth also recognising the importance of civilian staff. And according to SWDF, 62% of this employee group in 2014 were women. And the civilian staff bring specialist expertise uh, to allow officers to spend more time engaging with their communities. And they provide an important part of the service and have a crucial function in the operation of our police force. So it is therefore shocking that according to figures published by the SPA in 2013, a staggering 87% of police service staff who receive salaries that are less than £15,000 per annum are women. In the meantime, between 60 and 70% of staff members receiving over 65000 are men. So the terms of employment may be equal, but the reality is not yet so. It is so important that we make the necessary changes so that women feel they are treated fairly. We need our police force to be reflective of the society that they work to protect, and we need to make sure that we have women police officers who can inspire young girls to want to be involved so that we not only have a rich history, but also a vibrant future for women in our police force. Many thanks. I now call David Torrens to be followed by Elaine Murray. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to thank Linda Fabiani for securing this debate in Parliament today on this memorable issue. Every day our police force in Scotland does a remarkable job in protecting communities. It not only covers an area of 30,000 square miles, but also successfully managed the Commonwealth Games in the Ryder Cup last year. In order to do so, it is of great importance that the police force reflects Scotland's diverse society. Looking back in the past, this has not always been the case. Traditionally, the police force was a male-dominated institution. Today, I want to recount some of the historic developments which have led to greater inclusion of women. I would also like to talk about how far police force has come in endorsing as well as incorporating equality and diversity. As we celebrate 100 years of women in policing, I believe it is crucial to remember those brave women who have set important milestones for future generations. After Ada Smith became the first female officer in the UK, the first two Scottish officers, Emily Miller and Jean Thomason, were appointed by the City of Glasgow and Dundee City Police between 1915 and 1918. This certainly marked a remarkable turning point for women. However, segregation was very common within the police force in terms of distinct tasks, rank structure, and even separate offices. Nevertheless, from the late 1960s onwards, several important changes have been taking place. Since 1968, police women were granted to remain in their posts after marriage, and since the 1980s, women were allowed to wear trousers as part of their uniform. The Equal Pay Act in 1970 established the principle of equal pay for women. Most notably, in 1976, women police ceased to exist as a separate body and were integrated into a general police system. In recent years, an increasing number of women have assumed leadership positions within the police force. Norma Graham was appointed as Scotland's first female chief constable at Fife Constabulary in 2008. Since 2012, Rose Fitzpatrick has served as the deputy chief constable of Police Scotland. In fact, today I'm delighted to say that Police Scotland is fully committed to the principles of equality and diversity. 
with the formal establishment of Peace Scotland in 2013, values of integrity, fairness and respect have assumed a key role in delivering its services. Services which aspire to reach high quality consistency and accessibility in order to promote justice for all. To monitor how well Police Scotland integrate aforementioned values and the principles into everyday work of the organisation, a high-level high level action plan, the 2013 Equality and Diversity in Police Scotland report was created. Whilst allowing Police Scotland to look forward, it enshrines in what way equality and diversity will influence its services. Additionally, a working group of the Association of Chief Police Officers in Scotland, the Scottish Women's Development Forum, was formed. One of its main remits has been to advise Police Scotland, the Scottish Police Authority and the Scottish Government on issues of gender equality within the police service. Its membership is open to everyone who seeks to improve the working environment within the police force to enable all staff members to reach their full potential. Each year's Scottish Women's Development Forum pays tribute to input, efforts and achievements of its women's officers and staff members. The award ceremony aims to highlight both the diversity of excellent initiatives as well as the breadth of roles undertaken by women in the police force. In celebrating the 100th anniversary of women in policing, we can proudly look at recent statistics. In 2014, 29% of police officers were women, an increase of 11% since 2003. This number is predicted to rise in the future as nearly 40% of all new recruits are women. In terms of promotion, 20% of promoted posts were given to women. It shows that there is still room for improvement. However, I also believe that these statistics indicate no rank is now unattainable for women in the police force. Presiding officer, I am confident to say that these developments clearly show f f how far the police force has come, which transforming the organisation towards and achieving greater equality. It is an honour to speak about our police force and especially about women in policing today. Thus, I would like to conclude by wishing all members of Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority the best of luck in the future endeavours. Many thanks. <coughs> and our last open debate speaker is Elaine Murray. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And can I too start by congratulating Linda Fabiani on securing the debate today? And it's notable that they've, the first female officers were appointed during World War I, because how often is it the case that women get opportunities during times of war when men are away, opportunities which they would not other have, a, have, have been offered to them. And let's remember also at that time that women didn't have the vote. We didn't even have female suffrage at the time the first women police officers were appointed. As Alison McKinnon says, there had already been voluntary police officers. Uh, there had been women's police volunteers and the voluntary women's patrols in England uh, at the beginning of the war. And interestingly, they were often headed up by suffragettes. and They were actually part of the demonstration of women's ability to do the same jobs as men and their worth, worthiness of being given the suffrage as well. Others have mentioned that uh, Emily Miller joined Glasgow City Police in September 1914 and Jean Thomas, as the second woman, joined the City of Dundee Police in 1918. However, there had apparently already previously been a court sister uh, in Aberdeen in 1914. Uh, a lot less is known about this lady, but she had uh, many of the same responsibilities as uh, a police officer. She was, by accounts, uh, a very formidable lady. She weighed apparently something like 18 stone uh, and was quite capable of picking up recalcitrant male offenders and throwing them into the dock uh, if that was necessary. There was, as uh, Linda Fabia Annie said, considerable public resistance to the idea of female officers, in addition to the Chief Constable Dun in Dundee saying that, uh, denying that he had a female uh, officer, uh, the town clerk of Stirling around that time said something along the lines of, uh, we do not, ha we have no need of them and we do not want them. So there were, people did not want to have women officers out there. However, Things are much better at 100 years on, and 100 years of women policing was celebrated in June, uh, and they comprise around women, about around a third of the force. In Dumfries and Galloway, uh, there were two events to celebrate uh, this centenary, one in Port Rody in Stranraer and the other in Cornwall Mount in Dumfries. And as it happened on the 26th of June, I had a meeting arranged with V Divisional Commander Mike Leslie. And when I arrived at Cornwall Mount, Mike said to me, I think you'd be interested in this uh, 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 
exhibition that we have on, uh, and he asked Sergeant Nicola Robinson, who had organised the exhibitions, uh, to show me around uh, the exhibition. And it was absolutely fascinating, and particularly fascinating, actually, to be shown around by a serving police officer and to speak to other police officers. There was a lot of memorabilia from the legacy uh, Dumfries and Galloway Constabulary Museum with uh, photographs, photographs showing women police officers in knee-length skirts. And uh, when I observed them, I thought, indeed, how difficult it must be to undertake some of the duties of a police officer while wearing a knee-length skirt. Uh, and uh, there were all sorts of uh, pieces of equipment as well. There's also a photograph purporting to be of the court sister in Aberdeen, the one who used to hurl people into the dock. And she certainly, she was sitting down in a long dress and smoking a clay pipe. And I have to say, I, I certainly would not have crossed her had I met her anywhere near a court. Uh, the... It was also, as I say, a, 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 an array of, of different pieces of equipment. And you know, some of them, when you pick them up, they are pretty heavy. You do have to be pretty fit. You no longer have to be tall. You, know, you could probably be a police officer and be my height nowadays. But you have to be fit, as well as being, of course, very courageous. And the, the exhibition was actually well attended. One of the uh, intentions was that former police, female police officers would be able to come back and meet their colleagues and have a chat about uh, their time in, in the force. But as others have said, we must not forget that women are underrepresented, particularly at senior levels. So I think it's important that the role models of women police officers, and particularly senior women police officers, are promoted. I know that, of course, there's a chief constable of uh, Police Scotland's post is uh, up for filling. I just suggest to um, ACC Kate Thompson that she should put her hat in the ring. Kate comes from Dumfries and Galloway, and uh, she didn't say she wouldn't, so I'm hopeful that she is going to apply for that particular job. Uh, but we do want to see more girls. I, I do wonder still uh, how many little girls, you know, early in, at early stages in life, say, I would like to be a police officer. You know, that obviously later on people are, but I would like to see actually that sort of gender equality said that uh, young girls, just as much as young boys, might aspire to be a police officer. Thank you for presenting. Many thanks. And can I now invite Annabelle Ewing to respond to the debate. Minister, seven minutes or so, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I would like to start by paying tribute to uh, the, all our police uh, officers who provide such a sterling service to each and every one of us in our communities day in and day out. And in that regard, I too, on behalf of all colleagues, would wish to offer sincere condolences to the family and friends and colleagues of PC David uh, Phillips. Um, I, I thank Linda Fabiani on securing uh, this debate this evening on this very important milestone of 100 years of women in policing and I do thank all members for their very interesting uh, contributions. I in fact had the privilege of speaking at a passing out parade uh, at uh, Tully Allen at the Scottish Police College in June uh, where we did celebrate 100 years of women in policing and I also am aware that each of the 14 divisions in Police Scotland have also held their own local events to celebrate this landmark year and, year and we have heard of the events for example in Linda Fabiani's constituency uh, in East Kilbride where they held a very successful uh, uh, event in June of this year. The history of policing uh, shows uh, that the integration of women into all aspects of the profession has indeed taken many years uh, uh, as many members have highlighted and whilst new recruits to Police Scotland enter a completely different service to their volunteer counterparts 100 years ago uh, as we have heard, it, it's not that long ago that uh, female officers were still being restricted to wearing skirts and carrying handbags. That was dating back to the 1980s. So progress has indeed been uh, slow and not without obstacles. Uh, one of the interesting statistics that I don't think had been mentioned by members tonight was that uh, female officers, uh, w uh, police officers were barred from taking fingerprints until 1937. So that was another thing that caught me as being very uh, 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 odd. Um, and then, of course, we had the curious case, which I think we really need answers to, as to why the Chief Constable of Dundee in 1922 denied the very existence of his female constable. Why was that? We need more information about that. Uh, and uh, we heard from Elaine Murray the disturbing fact that it wasn't just Dundee, Stirling was at it as well. So I don't know what was going on there. But hopefully by the time that Graham Pearson uh, uh, started his service in 1970 in Glasgow, I believe, uh, we had moved on some 48 years. So at least we were recognising the role of, of uh, women uh, police officers at that stage albeit that there were still quite a number of significant restrictions uh, as to what uh, they uh, could actually do. 
Um, I know that Police Scotland uh, fully supports diversity in its workforce and aims to embed equality and diversity into every aspect of the service, allowing all female officers to have the same opportunity to develop and progress in the service. As a re result, we do thankfully now see women playing a pivotal role in all aspects of policing, albeit I do accept that more requires to be done. This progress has been largely due to women themselves challenging the status quo, and we should pay tribute to those female officers who have taken personal and professional risks to stand up uh, for their rights and the rights of other women, a point referenced by Annabel Goldie and indeed by David Torrance. Over the past century, women have increasingly taken on the range of responsibilities and demands of policing and have sought greater access to specialist roles and the freedom to seek promotion to the highest ranks. Whether through sheer determination and persistence or through court challenges, we should recognise that the freedoms female officers enjoy today have indeed been hard won. Police Scotland recognises that to gain the full potential from new recruits and to deliver a service which truly reflects the diverse communities it serves, it must have accessible recruitment options and working practices, which do indeed, as Alison McInnes highlighted, allow flexible working uh, and access to all aspects of its work. Uh, there are now, in that regard, three women in the Police Scotland executive team, and women have the opportunity to join any of these specialist units, enhancing opportunities for growth, development and promotion in the service. At the parade I attended in June, 37% of the new recruits that day were female. And there are currently around 5,150 female officers in Police Scotland, which makes up at this point approximately 29% of serving officers. Police Scotland also recognises the challenges it faces within our communities, but its commitment to mainstreaming equality matches the Scottish Government's commitment to work within our powers to help women fulfil their potential in the labour market. In the last year, we have seen female employment in general reach record levels in Scotland and female employment here is now, I believe, the second highest in the European Union. But, of course, we are not complacent. We know that there is much work to be done to tackle occupational segregation in the workplace and, indeed, the continuing pay gap. And we are committed to tackling inequality in all its shapes and forms in Scotland. Indeed, harnessing the potential of everyone in society makes us not just stronger, but also a much more successful society. So we will, as a government, continue to take action to ensure that more women are able to make informed choices about careers and to pursue those careers successfully throughout uh, their working lives. In conclusion, uh, presiding officer, I would just like to recognise in particular uh, the um, efforts of uh, Ms Fabiani's uh, constituents, or at least one of them, the current constituent, Dorothy Park and Barbara McAnally, and indeed the stories they were able to tell of their time in the force and, and the actions they had to take to ensure that their progression in the force uh, was something that happened as opposed to something that didn't happen, albeit that their existence wasn't being denied, at least by their senior officers, they still had to take much action to make their way uh, in the force. And I commend them for, for the, uh, the service that they both uh, provided to our communities. Uh, I would like to recognise uh, the uh, enormous contribution women have made in policing over the past 100 years. I thank again uh, Linda Fabiani for ensuring that this moment, this milestone, has been duly recognised by the Chamber. Uh, and I have absolutely no doubt uh, that as we go forwards, women will continue to make a very powerful contribution uh, to Scotland's policing in the years ahead. Uh, and we will see many more women uh, progressing to the very top uh, where they should be, in my uh, opinion, as uh, Minister for Women's Employment, among other things. Uh, so we, we see them where they should be, at the top of the uh, uh, Police Scotland. And I am sure and confident that we will see that happen uh, uh, in the years ahead. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many thanks, Minister. That concludes Linda Fabiani's debate on 100 years of women in policing. And I now close this meeting of Parliament.